Hi, welcome to this week's Authors Love Readers podcast, where we delve into the stories behind the stories. We're asking authors questions, some of them fun, some of them serious. And from their answers, you're going to learn things you never knew about the people who write the stories you love. My name is Patricia McGlynn. I'm your host and designated question asker. I'm Laura Resnick, and I'm an author who loves readers. Now, let's start the show. Hi, welcome to this edition of Authors Love Readers, and our guest is Laura Resnick. Laura and I have known each other for quite a while, kind of just in the writing world, the way you kind of are aware of other people. And then back in 06, or was, well, 07, I guess, um, I was president of Novelist Inc., and Laura was elected as the president-elect, who um, is kind of in training to take over the presidency the next year. And I will admit, I had some trepidations, because neither Laura uh, nor I is... um, (laughs) wishy-washy. <laughs> How's that for subtle, Laura? Well, I was going to say, we met when you were young. I still am, of course. <laughs> You're following this just as <laughs> fast as I am, girl. Oh, it's a good description. Yeah. So, But we did great. I thought we were a terrific we were. team. We worked very well um, together. Yeah, and we, we hit some crises as often do and we but I had bail money so it all went well (laughs) that was to bail her out I told her she could not go to jail until after I was done being president Mm. that was the deal that was actually then she was on her own (laughs) so Laura is the author of um a diverse a, a kind of, you've had a diverse career and now is publishing a great urban fantasy series, and we'll come back and talk about that some more. But first, let's talk, uh, let's do some quick, quirky questions to, just to kind of get to know you. What's your favorite taste? I like really, really salty foods, stuff like um, feta mm. cheese, capers, Greek olives, uh, caper berries. I like things often so salty that normal people don't like them. Even thinking about it makes my mouth water. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, we'll get off that so we don't make you want to end the the discussion right away. Um, Do you have a childhood book that addicted you to story? I do. It's basically the first book I ever got all the way through by myself. I was seven years old, and I read a Nancy True mystery called The Witch Tree Symbol. I was very intrigued by the title, And I don't remember the story much now, but I remember even as hard as it was for me to read the book, it was beyond my reading level. I was just so absorbed by the story. I really stuck with it, got all the way through the book, improved my reading level a lot. And that was when I became a voracious reader. And I read like the next 50 Nancy Drew books and lots and lots of other stuff. And that book is really kind of a turning point for me. Have you ever gone back to it? You know, I have it? not. Something, uh, actually, when I was trying to remember the title of it, I was like, I, I ought to do that. I have never gone back and reread it. I think it, it can be hard, though, as especially once you're a writer, to go back and reread books um, that you loved when you were younger because you, you see the mechanisms. Well, since that's a kid's book, you know, not, I, I don't know, not necessarily because it's not really something I, I do or have read in years, but I have definitely noticed that with books I really enjoyed or writers I really enjoyed when I was, say, around 20, that now often I, if I pick them up, I think, what did I like about this? Do, do you have any stories or did you have a story before you were an author that you thought, oh, this just doesn't end right. I don't like this. And and you at least mentally rewrote uh, it? For me, it was probably the same one it was for millions of people. I was a huge fan of the movie Casablanca. I still am. It's probably my all-time favorite movie. And for years as a girl, a teenager, a young woman, I thought that at the end of the movie, and here's a spoiler people, but the movie's like 80 years old, so get over it. I thought that Ilza should have gone off with Rick. 
Um, and so I would rewrite it in my head that way. And, you know, what would happen next and so on. Um, now that I'm an older woman, I realize, no, 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 Victor Laszlo was much the better choice. Rick shouldn't have even had to tell her that. She should have known that. You want to go off with the man who, like, has a commitment and a stable job and is very understanding when he finds out about your <laughs> adultery. You don't want to spend your life with the um, alcoholic who has raging fits of jealousy. But at the time, I didn't really realize that. I was young. Now, I always thought that they should, she should go off with Victor. They should win World War II. And then she goes to Rick. Once you get the serious save the world stuff done, then you can have the great romance. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I love that movie. But the older I get, the more I just find Rick really tiresome. Oh, you I mean. am. <laughs> How can you do that? I mean, he's a great character, but if you think of living with him, very tiresome. <laughs> Far too practical. <laughs> okay. Do you have any things from earlier in your life that you fretted over that you now... I, I actually am having a hard time imagining you fret over something. But okay, that you fretted over that now you don't give a darn about. This one will really surprise you. It will surprise anyone who knows me well now. When I was young, say in my 20s, I fretted over whether people thought I was nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Who would think? But I did. I know. Now I'm like, oh, who cares? In fact, I, I'm very comfortable with not being thought of as nice. But no, it really, in my early 20s, I really, I fretted over that. I, you know, what can I say? I was young and dumb. How did you get past that? You know, it just became too much effort. <laughs> and when I, I stopped having the energy as life got more and more complicated to make the effort to try to be thought of as nice, I found out I was really much more comfortable. And people whose opinions actually mattered to me, they didn't always think I was nice, but they liked me. They cared about me anyhow. So I think that was really well, it. It's very sane, which you probably also don't hear very often. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so you have your reservations about Casablanca. What three movies would you take with you to a desert island? Yes, this desert island has the ability to play movies. Oh, who <laughs> cares? Sure the issue is I'm stranded <laughs> on a desert island. I'm not going to be watching movies. I'm going to be trying to be rescued. <laughs> What do you do at night when you're tired? You have to do something. I build bonfires Three. in hope of being rescued. Three movies, Laura. <laughs> well, Casablanca, obviously. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so you can gripe about it, huh? No, no, I actually love that movie. I just uh, no longer think it should have ended differently. No, I love that movie. Um, I would also <laughs> I would bring Who's Killing the Great Chefs of Europe because that is a comedy and I will need cheering up. And it's full of all of these fabulous, wonderful meals and I'll probably be missing good food. And I would bring um, a Bollywood movie called Kabikushi Kabigam, which was a popular movie about 15 years ago that I enjoyed. And I would bring it because it's like four and a half hours long and I will have a lot of empty time to fill. <laughs> In between bonfires. Yes. <laughs> so those would be my choices, I guess. Not necessarily the three best films I've ever seen, but they would serve their purpose. Very practical. Um, okay, what's a saying of your mother or your father that you hear yourself saying now? Oh, it's one of my favorites of my mom's. It's um, that person, you're speaking of someone specific, that person is a silly millimeter deep. <laughs> And which of your parents says that? My mom. That's great. That's mm -hmm. great. Okay. I don't know why this fascinates me, but it does. Your dominant hand, and you're right-handed, aren't you? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Is your ring finger or your index finger longer? My ring finger, and I have never noticed that before, nor do I have any idea what it's <laughs> supposed to mean. I have lived nope. with this hand for over half a century without ever... <laughs> noticing that it's my job to open your eyes to these new <laughs> things in the world right okay i see i've got to ask you this qu question do you have any strong fears have you ever used them in a book yeah i'm very frightened of snakes and i've used that a couple of times in books i've never actually made a character as frightened of snakes as i am because i think readers would find it really over the top <laughs> but i've, I've written <laughs> yeah 
somebody I share that with actually is, um, I don't think I'm giving anything away, Tammy Hogue. And she's used that a number of times in her books. It, it strictly, uh, literally as afraid of snakes? Or do you think that's also accessing that fear to explain other things? Uh, I think it's strictly snakes. I think it's the real life thing. Certainly when I was, you know, uh, very young, I was fascinated by the Freudian interpretation of that. But that doesn't really apply, I don't think. I think it's really just snakes. <laughs> the the movement or the perceived I don't even slime. like talking about it, in all honesty. <laughs> like, I am that phobic. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, oh, darn. I was really going to delve into this. <laughs> Oh, this is a question I haven't asked anybody else, and I've got to ask you because I think it'll drive you crazy. If your writing were a color, what color would it be? Uh, I think it would be a really fiery color, like a bright gold orange sort of thing. Oh, that's good. And I, I, think... like the, yeah, I like the gold with that. I have this reaction to some authors like to me Agatha Christie is always orange, but it's a more muted orange. It's, you know, kind of a rusty orange maybe old blood huh hmm. I never thought of it in terms of color but you know I think of something like really bright like that because what I like as a writer also enjoy as a reader but what I think I gravitate to as a writer is um larger than life characters and a lot of action a lot of dialogue a lot of pace I don't uh, I don't think I will ever write a, a gentle introspective novel about a woman uh you know, discovering who she really is. It, it's its just not something that attracts me. I like, you know, uh, let's get like half a dozen zany characters together and send them on a chase sort of thing is what I like to write. So I, I think about a high energy color. Okay. And this leads to a question from one of the readers who says, where do your stories come from? I know one author who dreams her stories. Another has a character suddenly taking up residence in her head. So how are your beautiful stories born? You know, it's um, funny, you should ask, because I was complaining recently, like just a, three, four years ago, to one of my closest, oldest, dearest friends, like, God, why do people always ask where writers' ideas come from? How boring? How, why does anyone even ask? We all know. And she looked at me, she's like, people ask you idiot, because <laughs> they don't know, Laura. And it was an eye opener to me to realize not everybody thinks like writers. I, because uh, I've always thought this way. And as you know, I was raised by a writer, my father's uh, mm -hmm. writer. And uh, we had a lot of writers around the house growing up when I was growing up and so on. I, I thought this was explain normal. Who, explain who your dad is. Uh, my father is Mike Resnick. He's a science fiction writer. He's quite well known in his field and he's been writing since about the time I was born so I have always lived with this kind of uh, lifestyle and this kind of thinking and to me stories come from absolutely everywhere every situation every sight every sound suggests a potential story idea and that seems completely normal to me and it was only quite recently I realized no not everybody sees the world that way I just assumed uh, the only difference between writers and non-writers was writers were the people who then put their butt in the chair and crafted a full beginning, middle, and end type of story out of that, and everybody else was um, busy doing other things. So my books start from, or my stories start from all different sorts of places, and it's a very natural, organic process that I is so natural to me, I genuinely didn't know everyone doesn't have it until quite recently. So that sort of answers a, a, another question that I, I like to ask is whether you think uh, writers observe the world and people differently or um, approach things differently. And you're saying you didn't realize that until just recently. Yeah, I mean, I think clearly we do. I, I just wasn't aware of it because the way we, I know so many writers, I was raised around writers, the way we approach things just was what I believed was normal. And it turns out I'm mistaken. That rarely happens, you know. <laughs> and, and even more rarely that you acknowledge it. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so you have this story idea, however it comes to you. How do you start 
converting that from a, an idea or an impression or a character into a book? Um, for me, typically, I'm very much of a, um, I'm very methodical. I'm, and I think the way people write is reflective of the way, in most cases, we also live. I'm very methodical about how I do most things. I'm, what do you say, a plotter, not a panster. Um, I, I'm the sort who, um, before I go anywhere new, I've got all of the directions printed out and I've read them, that sort of thing. <laughs> and I write that way too. You know, there are writers who just like say, no, no, make it fun, sit down and have a creative rush. Uh, we had a mutual friend um, since passed away, Joe Beverly, who used to say, fly into the mist and mm. see where that takes you. And I'd be like, what mist? There is no mist. Um, There's lots of mist. <laughs> well, yes, but I'm not flying into it. Uh, I typically sit down, um, still the old-fashioned way, with a notebook and a pen, because um, there's all this software you can use. Now I'm like, no, now I have to think technically. I, that's not really good for me when I'm working on a story idea. So I just sit down with a notebook and a pen, and I'll do this a lot for a while, and I'll just make a lot of notes, and I'll write down a lot of questions as I start to think of the story idea, you know, uh, I often start with a character, um, I think, well, you know, why would this person do this or what do they want or who will they encounter? Um, or if there's a story idea without a character yet, what sort of person would do this or would want this and who would they, uh, come into confrontation with? And I'll, I'll write a lot of questions like that to myself and I'll make all sorts of notes and arrows and diagrams and I'll fill a notebook with what I assume is indecipherable to anyone but me and I don't really refer back to it that much I think that this is just the process that starts helping me work out the cement the cement paces of the story what now that I have you know a few ideas um, an idea is different from a story it's it's you know and it's a spark for a story I don't even mm -hmm. know if it's a starting place it's the spark now I have a starting place and I'm going beyond that to get some of the steps in the journey and that's where I start. And how do you integrate that? How do you integrate that with, um, like, you have world building in your Esther Diamond series, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I do. I also uh, did really elaborate world building in. Um, I have a traditional uh, traditional fantasy trilogy, um, the Salarian trilogy I did, which was set in a make believe world as sword and sorcery fantasy often is. So there, you're starting absolutely from scratch with your world building. It's not even a, a version of our world. It's something else entirely. Um, I tend to think in my genre, fantasy, and this is uh, not how most people think, I think world building gets really overemphasized. It's just setting. And the difference is rather than researching your setting, you know, rather than researching um, 12th century Italy or 18th century France or 21st century New York, Instead of researching it, you're inventing most of it, but you want, in either case, um, the same level of detail, uh, not more, not less, and you want it to be kind of the same level of textured background to your story. So I've pretty, you know, if I start with world building, I kind of start with a concept, like um, uh, this is a society that's been at war for so long that war has become very profitable to everybody and almost nobody wants peace. And I could start there, but then I think of the characters and their conflicts next and all of the little details of world building, like in fantasy you have magic systems and ethnic groups and religions and weapons. All of that comes later. Um, and it's not separate. It's, it's sort of an accessory to the core of the story for me. And it's the same way with the urban fantasy. Are you doing that, though, separately from creating the action of the story and the characters of the story? Do those, do those world-building details arise out of... Um, they arise out of the story. What the characters are doing? Yeah, they never come out separately. Mm -hmm. I never sort of have a story and then think, you know, oh, let me go create a magic system. It always comes directly out of the characters and the conflict and the setting. Um, I'm, but then as you establish those rules in, in, in your world that you've built, do they ever back you into a corner? 
in the writing? Um, only in the sense that if you are setting something, say, in you know, 15th century Spain, the reality of your research might back you into, corner, into a corner at some point that you've got to replot your way out of, oh, only in that sense. Yeah, but then history did that to you. You didn't do it to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Well, if you're making up the world, if you're making it's your up the fault. world, you have more flexibility. <laughs> but um, uh, here's an example: I had in the urban fantasy series, I uh, created just this this casual joke that found its way into the first manuscript, where um, the the sort of the the gatekeeper of the fantasy world, a character named Max, who's a, a 350 year old wizard who runs a, an occult bookstore in New York City, 21st century New York City. And he engages with a contemporary actress, Esther Diamond, the protagonist of the series. And he just sort of casually asks her in passing, oh, by the way, you're not Lithuanian, are you? And it just kind of worked its way into the, into the text. And I thought it was funny, so I left it in. And in all my revisions, I, I kind of thought it was funny, and I left it in. And um, so it worked its way into the next book. And by the time it worked its way into the third book, readers were saying, so what's the Lithuanian thing? And my editor saying, what's the Lithuanian thing? I had only dropped it in there because I thought it was funny. And now I'm like, oh, crap, I have to come up with it has, the, to, pay it has to pay off or it's just dumb. So the entire fourth book <laughs> was based on explaining what the Lithuanian thing is. <laughs> Did you tell your editor, it's a secret, I don't want to tell you yet? <laughs> Sometimes, yeah. <laughs> You're desperately in the background going, oh my God, what's the Lithuanian yeah, thing? Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. That was how, the third book, I'm like, oh crap, what is the Lithuanian thing? <laughs> and I, there are several ways in which I, I did that to my, I've done that to myself in that series. And, you know, you come up with something and then it's kind of like Chekhov's thing, one of my favorite um guidelines for writing is uh it's attributed to the playwright Chekhov when he said if there's mm -hmm. a rifle over the fireplace in the first act you've got to use it by the third act and if you use a rifle in the third act it has to have been over the fireplace since the first act and I think that is just a mm -hmm. great tidy summary for how plot and story and structure and indeed world building need to work and the good thing about writing is uh, much like sausage no one sees the process so in the context of one book, it can be a terrible mess when you start. By the time you deliver it to your editor, it can be very tidy as if you knew all along the rifle was there. <laughs> um, in a series, you just kind of cover your tracks a little bit better and lie when you're in front of people. Oh, yeah, I know what the Lithuanian thing is. I'm just, you know, building the suspense. <laughs> So what's your favorite part and what's the worst part of the process for you? Uh, Liftoff is definitely the worst part of the process for me. Every book I've ever written, the first 150 pages, almost exactly the first 150 pages are just torture. They're just, they're horrible. It's slow. It's sluggish. It's not very good. I don't enjoy it. Um, the part I really like is uh, I like writing toward the end of a book. Well, I love having written. Who doesn't? I love it when it's done. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. in terms of process, um, I don't do multiple drafts or rough drafts or anything. I, I write and then mm -hmm. I fix what I've written and I go forward and then I go back and I fix and I go forward and I go back. I just keep fixing as I go along because I don't know what comes next until everything that's before it is pretty much the way it needs to be for this next thing to happen. So by the time I'm writing the last, say, three chapters of a book, the whole rest of the book is really tight, it's really set in stone, and I'm really focused and know what I need to do. And that's the first time, usually, those final chapters, where I really feel like I know what I need to do, and it goes pretty fast. Prior to that, it's really, really a struggle. So do you have stories that maybe hit that 150 pages mark that never went beyond that that are half I do you know, well that would be less than half finished because you tend to write long I do mostly they're from earlier in my career I um I had an idea and there were several times I wrote anywhere from 75 to 150 pages and kind of ran out of steam and realized I I don't really have more than this I don't know where this is going 
if you have a contract, that tends to really motivate you to figure out where it's going. <laughs> if you do not have a contract, um, you tend to think, I, you know, I, I, think, I feel ready to put this aside for something um, more likely to cover my mortgage payment and do it that way. So, but yeah, it, it hasn't happened in a long time, but it did happen a few times. So do you still hold on to those? Do you go back and look at them? Do you hold out any hope that they will revive at some um, point? No, I did for a while. I have a folder where I keep all my ideas, whether they're just like, you know, a couple of notes on one piece of paper, or in some of those cases, chapters written. I keep a file there. And every year or two, I go through everything to see what am I still interested in and really want to do. And a lot mm. of it will stay. Uh, the Esther Diamond series actually is one that I wanted to do for years. And back when you had to have a publisher to reach readers, uh, nobody would buy it. And every year I looked at it and I still loved it and I would keep it there. And now I'm on, you know, the eighth book of the series uh, with a publisher. But there are other things. Well, and a publisher did buy yeah. it. But there are other things that I go through the folder. And after three or four or six years or five months, I look, I'm like, yeah. I'm not the same writer I was when I came up with this. I'm not that interested anymore. There are other things I'd rather mm. do, and I delete it at that point. I don't save it. And those projects I mentioned were all things I ultimately said. I, I don't even, I'm not even interested in this anymore, and I moved on. But you haven't thrown them out. I did. I out. threw them out, yeah. Oh, you did yeah, throw yeah, them I out. Throw, okay. I'm, I'm not a saver. I throw out anything I'm not really engaging with. I always have. I've actually, I, mm -hmm. throw, I threw out a completed manuscript that uh, was one of the early things I wrote. I sold two books. I had a third completed manuscript that nobody would buy. I kept it for a few years, and then one day I read it and went, okay, I see why nobody would buy this. It's really flawed, and I threw it out at that point. I'm not a saver. I still have one, that a completed manuscript that, um, actually I have two, but I haven't thrown them out. I, I keep thinking... There could be something I could do with it. <laughs> and, you know, maybe there is. I mean, I uh, throw and things not, out I'm when I feel a, like I'm not interested in this, and that's when it's time. I'm not a big pack rat. Mm -hmm. But I think you have a really great point about how we change as writers and that what what we wrote and could write early earlier in our career changes as you go mm -hmm. along. Both, it, I, I think you become better, but in some ways I also think you become... Um, more tied to a certain way of viewing the world uh, and think because it's not so much technical as I, I think is worldview yeah I think it is um absolutely worldview I, I'm sure when I was a younger writer I tackled stuff I maybe didn't have the craft skills or experience to do well but I was ready to tackle it that didn't stop me it's more when I look back, I don't throw out something because I think, oh, it was a great idea, but I didn't execute well. I think, I'm not interested in that concept anymore, mm -hmm. in those characters, that story, that tone. Mm -hmm. I've, mm -hmm. I've moved on. I'm just not interested. It's not that the skill isn't there. Well, sometimes it's not. You also write short stories. Yes, I right? do. Mm -hmm. Can you tell at the beginning whether an idea is going to be a novel or a short story? Yeah, I can. For me, I'm. it's ironic because people, I've, I've published like, I think it's about 70 short stories now, a lot. So I was surprised to find out that a few of my friends thought I was, um, think of me as, you know, someone who is a natural short story writer. I'm not at all. I don't think in short story terms. I don't read short stories. Um, short stories are hard for me to come up with. And sort of the evolution of how I wound up with all of these short stories is uh, it's a very popular form in my genre, science fiction, fantasy. So there's lots and lots of opportunity and um, lots of people are putting together and have always been putting together books and anthologies and collections where they'll invite a bunch of writers in based on a theme. So I, I think out of 70 short stories, I think 68 of them, I was invited by somebody to write based uh -huh. on a theme. And what I have found is uh, if somebody kind of gives me uh, some sort of guideline or parameter or premise that's, you know, unifying the, the theme of the anthology, that helps me an awful lot come up with a short story. If it's just, uh, oh, Laura, this editor at this magazine likes your writing, send them a short story. It can take me two years to think of something because I'm not a natural short story writer. And the reason being, uh, short stories, I mean, I am, I'm a character writer. 
that's what interests me in a novel. It's what I'm good at. It's what my strengths are. It's what I tend to focus on character development and relationships and how characters change through conflict and their relationships and over time and so on. And that's a novel format. Short stories are much too short to show a, a long evolution of a character or a relationship. Uh, you can do it, but it, mm -hmm. because of the form, it would be kind of gimmicky. Short stories are really idea fiction, and I'm not an idea writer. So for me, one reason I know something's a short story is I have been asked to write a short story. That's almost always how I do it. And I've been asked on the basis of a theme. And the difference to me is very clear between a short story. It's, it's idea-based. It's a gimmick. It's a concept. It's something pretty brief. And a novel is something about the journeys that characters take. Do, do, have you ever had short stories or ideas for short stories that have become part of novels? I could see where they weren't necessarily the germ for a novel, but they could be a tangent almost. No, but I have gone the other way. Um, again, when I was trying to sell the Esther Diamond series, um, I just had this concept for the second book that I loved doppelganger. Um, and the title alone <laughs> attracts people and it kind of sells it. And the idea being that mobsters are being bumped off in mysterious ways shortly after seeing their own perfect double. And I'm not normally a concept writer, but it was just this really tight concept. Well, I couldn't sell the series and I couldn't sell the series. And um, I came to believe after like five or six years of this, I would never get to write that book back when you could only get things out there if you had a, a traditional publisher. So I took that concept and I used it in a short story uh, called Doppelgangster. So I went the other way with that. And I did that a few times over the years when I had some sort of concept that was kind of going to be the MacGuffin for a novel. And for one reason or another, I mm -hmm. thought, you know, I don't know if I'm ever going to get to write that book. So I would take that concept and pluck it out and use it for a short story. So I went the other direction. But the short stories were not, you know, remotely like what I had pictured for the novel with that concept, because the novels were really character driven and short stories generally are not. Explain what a MacGuffin is for any listeners who aren't familiar uh, with the term. It's the sort of the kickoff concept of a book, like, um, you know, the MacGuffin of Gone with the Wind is uh, at the start of the Civil War, this spoiled Southern Belle is torn between two men and will spend the rest of the book uh, bouncing between her attraction for them and her changing role uh, in this changing world that she lives in. And um, for Doppelgangster, the MacGuffin is this thing about mobsters seeing their perfect doubles before they die. At which of your stories, novel or short story, has surprised you the most, and how did it surprise you? Mm, so it was definitely in Legend Born. Um, that book was a huge journey for me. It's the first book of the Solarian trilogy. It's traditional fantasy novel, sword and sorcery, epic fantasy. When I started it, uh, I pictured it as, you know, this 90,000 word book. It's a, a fairly short book, a book you could read in a couple of evenings, probably. Fairly short book, a coming of age story about a teenager written in the first person point of view. The actual book <laughs> is um, about 250,000 <laughs> words. It's almost three times the length of what I imagine. And uh, it has 10 point of view characters is written in the third person 10 point of view characters and this enormous epic sweep and it was not something I even thought I could do in fact I remember saying at the start I can't do this this is not what I do I can't do this not capable of this and um, so that book in many ways just kept surprising me did you try to write it in first person at at the beginning, how did it how did it evolve from you thinking first person to third person? I can see how a book could keep growing. It's really the only time ever in all of my dealings with literary agents. It's the one time a literary agent um, gave me good advice and did something that helped me rather than um, hurt me. Um, and I don't deal with literary agents anymore because I had just so many really bad, you know, 
experiences with him that held me back. But this is an, the opposite of my normal experience. I showed this, um, the first chapter or two of this book with the outline to my literary agent. And me just having said, you know, world building is not really the thing. He liked the world building a lot. What he said is, you know, having looked at it, well, I like this, but, you know, if I take this to an editor, we're going to get like a little $5,000 deal and the book's going to be released straight to paperback and forgotten very quickly. But if you kind of take this this concept you're, you're working with, because it was going to be the first of three books or something, so you take this concept and if you could expand it to an epic canvas, something really big, that would that would really get us a good deal. We'd get a good hardcover deal. You'd be launched really well. It would really do a lot for your career. And I didn't think I could do this. I didn't think it would work. But I went back to the drawing board. And I took back a much bigger idea to him. It was still in first person. And he said, you know, this has really shown so much improvement. But I think first person's going to limit the story. Could you try it in third person? And I thought, oh, I really can't do that. That's not a good idea. I'll, I'll do it and show them it's not going to work. And once I started doing it, I went, oh, actually, this is better. <laughs> so he, I have to say for all that, I have a lot of negative stories about that agent. He made a tremendous difference for me in that instance. And I've always acknowledged that. Uh, and that was really sort of the launch pad. And even at that point, having come up with I had like this 25 page outline of this incredibly big, sweeping and complicated plot and all of these larger than life characters. And I had about 70 pages of uh, text chapters that really launched it. I still didn't think I could do it. And I was at least halfway through that book before I was like, oh, look, I'm doing it. <laughs> Getting to, you know, roughly <laughs> quarter of a million words with this thing. So that book. But you were going to show him. No, you I really didn't show care. him. <laughs> I was. Um, I had a contract to fulfill at that point. He sold it really quickly. And now I had, well, if I want the, you know, if I actually don't want to have to give back the money and be, you know, crawl away with my tail between my legs, now I actually have to deliver this book I've described. And that was what got me there. And um, the whole process to me on that book was just a big surprise. It was a huge leap forward in, in my craft, my storytelling, uh, my, my vision of uh, how much more brave I should be when tackling projects, everything really. It's echoed through your subsequent yeah, I books. mean, they aren't all 250,000 words, thank God. <laughs> but yeah, it's just taught me, you know, go for it. Just absolutely go for it. That's a great mm -hmm. lesson, it is. isn't it? I, I, I have to keep <laughs> learning it. <laughs> Learn I it do over too. And it's over not like over. I got it perfectly after that. Now, you talked about when we were talking about world building, you talked about um, that if you were doing, you know, historical research, you know, 15th century Spain, you would be restricted by mm -hmm. the realities of that, of that research. Do you find that you also need to do research for your books in addition to the world bi building? And how do you feel I about research? I enjoy research. And yeah, I, I do quite a lot of research um, for uh, epic fantasy um, where you're, you're kind of coming up with a make-believe world. The research you do depends on um, how you're structuring your world. Basically, I did for the Solarian Trilogy lots of research about weapons and hand-to-hand um, -hand combat and combat with bladed weapons because uh, it's a very violent trilogy and one of the main characters is an expert swordsman. So I wanted to be able to convey that in some credible way. I didn't want to write something that, you know, the very first person who's ever taken a fencing class would read it and go, oh, this is garbage. She didn't know what she was talking about. Mm -hmm. And that's one example of the kind of research that goes in there. With my urban fantasy series, um, yeah, I do quite a lot, of, a lot of research there because I am introducing uh, a magical fantasy concept to the real world setting of New York City. And I do a whole lot of research about. Mm. So you have to have correct. the reality. So I first. do a lot of research about New York, and part of the conceit of the series is each book uses a different specific um, setting or background in New York. So one book would be entirely um, set in, well, almost entirely set in, uh, say, a theater in the West Village. So you want to make sure. Uh, you know what goes on in a theater and what uh, the different rooms are called and 
um, what kind of equipment is back there and what it smells like and uh, so on and so forth. You want to have some reality there. But in a much more complicated um, background research I did in that series, one book is set, uh, The Misfortune Cookie. It's set entirely in Chinatown. And um, a lot of the characters are Chinese or Chinese Americans. And I did tons of research on that because mm -hmm. uh, mm. you want to get the veracity and the texture. I also did a lot of on-site research, which I do for that series, which I really enjoy. Like when I have kind of picked uh, the settings for the next couple of books, I like to go to New York and spend a lot of time on site, getting as much uh, hands-on background as I can. And I feel that's helped the books a lot. Um, somebody said to me, you know, New York is like another character in these books. And that's what I want. So mm -hmm. I think it's well worth doing that level of, of research. Do you find that as you're doing the research, it, it can change a story because of something you found, either closing off a door yeah, or opening both of other those. doors? I typically... You know, I don't plot a book and then go do my research. It's when I'm thinking, right, I want to set the next book in Chinatown or um, I want to set the next book on Wall Street. And I go there and I start doing uh, the research and that will start shaping some of the details or um, markers of the story in my mind. And there may be things I thought before I I did my research or go on my trip that once I get there, I realize, well, that won't work, but it's not a huge change because I don't really have a storyline yet for the most part. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Do you tell people what you're doing while you're researching? Do you, and do you talk to people? People always ask the same questions when they, when you say you're a writer, Oh, have you ever written anything? Yes. That's why I say I'm a writer. Oh, <laughs> have you ever read anything published? Yes. That's why I say I'm a writer. Oh, have I read anything you've written? How the fuck do I know what you read? You know, <laughs> I don't so, know. <laughs> sometimes um, it depends on the circumstance, but very often I do not say. Though when people see me taking lots of notes and asking very detailed questions, if they start to look suspicious, then I say what I do. It it depends. I recently was on a cruise. This um, as you know, and I have this idea for a murder mystery. And so I um, arranged with some persistence to talk to one of the officials on the uh, ship and ask about what they do if they find a body who that does not appear to have died from natural Oh, they must causes. have enjoyed that. <laughs> he was... <laughs> he was very nervous initially, very wary of me. <laughs> Eventually, I won him over, though, with my my charm and innocence. <laughs> now, if I wanted to kill someone using this pliers, exactly how would you recommend I do that? <laughs> mm -hmm. Research is fun. <laughs> so, with with your background, did you ever? think that you would do a different job from writing? Were you always thinking no, you were going to be a writer? No, since I grew up in a writer's house, I never wanted to be a writer. Uh, I saw what kind of lifestyle it was. I remember as a child seeing my father walking to the mailbox every day, wondering if he'd been paid yet. And, <laughs> you know, and I saw that he spent uh, all of his working life just alone in a room in a grubby sweater, unshaven, um, type, 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 typing away madly. Uh, all of his friends were mm, weird, as writers are. I just, it, you know, it wasn't the life I wanted for myself. Uh, I actually really wanted to go on the stage. I wanted to go into theater. Uh, and I trained very seriously as an actress. But I really didn't have the temperament for it. I, um, I think a huge difference between acting and writing is when you get rejected as a writer, you're at home alone in your comfortable space reading a letter or email mm -hmm. telling you, why you're being rejected. As an actress, you're kind of standing up there in front of a table of people who are staring at you as they reject you. And other people are watching this and then you have to go home yeah. alone. And I didn't have the temperament for any of that. I found it excruciating. Um, whereas getting a rejection as a writer doesn't seem to bother me that much. So, and I, I really prefer kind of, it turns out being alone in the room with the characters in my head compared to um, doing eight shows a week or 
you know, doing a lot of, um, as an actor, you're often doing material that's not that good. And as a writer, you mostly get to do the best work you're capable of. Um, so there were just a lot of ways in which I was always much better suited to this life. And I did wind up writing early on. I think I sold my first book at uh, 25. So I started pretty young, comparatively speaking. I would have thought that one of the things that, that would appeal to you about writing over um, being an actor would be control. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> As an okay. actor, I was well, right among there, other huh? things, you know, it's very hard actually to act if you haven't been hired, you know, because you need other actors, you need uh, a space, you need production, you need time. As a writer, uh, all, you, all I needed to get started was a notebook and a pen and a few hours to myself, and I could do whatever I wanted as a writer. Whether or not you get published is another matter, but you, you don't need anything outside of yourself to write a book. And I liked that about it. I still do. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. That you, and I, I suppose you do in, in, um, in acting too, you, but you, you definitely need yourself and you need to be able mm-hmm. to go inside yourself, yeah. I think, to write, um, which can scare some people well, off. Well, it's very solitary, um, extremely solitary. And I, I think there are people who don't like that about it. I think there are even writers who don't like that about writing. Um, it's, you know, writers are frequently people who actually enjoy being alone in a, in a room a, a lot of their lives. I'm one of them. <laughs> yeah, there, there will be discussions online where somebody will say, Oh my gosh, I had to take a shower and go out and meet people. And, and all these other authors are going, oh, you poor soul. And, and civilians are going, what? Exactly, huh? yes. <laughs> so this is a, this is a out of the blue question. Um, what is something or several somethings that you are really good at that people don't know about? Well, um, my friends know, but otherwise I suppose not. Uh, I'm a very good cook. Um, and I love cooking because it's the opposite of writing. You know, writing, you do, it's so much in your head or just at a keyboard on a screen or piece of paper that only you see. It's very intellectual. It's very uh, private. When you're done with it, uh, you send it off to an editor who just tells you everything that's wrong with it. And then it's like a year before it's published and you share it with other people. Writing by contrast, I mean cooking by contrast, you go into your kitchen and it's very sensory oriented. You're smelling and tasting, uh, you're cutting and chopping and kneading and wrapping and wrestling stuff. It takes about an hour to make a nice meal and you immediately share it with people who appreciate it and compliment you. (laughs) So... Yeah, so that's a lot of what I enjoy about it. I enjoy experimenting. I have an enormous cabinet chock full of spices and herbs and some things in there I don't even know how to use and it's fun to pull them out and say, well, you know, let me try this. And if it doesn't work, I wasted an hour and I'll have one bad meal rather than if you try something in a novel that doesn't work, you might be wasting months and losing a lot of income. So there's a whole lot about cooking I really Mm. enjoy. And doing it a lot makes me good at it. Do you follow re- Do you follow recipes, uh, or do you make things up? Do you um, wing it? I do both ways. I I tend to really enjoy following recipes. Like the first time I make something, and then I start tweaking it to make it more my own. What's the best thing you've made lately? My new thing is I'm learning to make British meat pies. I lived in England for three years. And I really love meat pies, things like Cornish pasty and steak and kidney pie Mm. and things like that. And we really don't do that over here. And it finally occurred to me years after coming back, you know, instead of just pining for that stuff, what if I just learned to make it? And so I got a British cookbook on making savory pies, and I've been making some of those. And uh, I'm not very good at the pastry yet. I'm not a natural baker. I'm improving on that. But I have made uh, I made a, a roasted vegetable pie two weeks ago that came out really pretty well and was very pretty. And mm-hmm. I've made a few things like that. So that's kind of my new um, project. And I'm quite proud of my efforts so far. What do you think makes somebody a natural baker? Um, I don't know because I'm not one, but you have to be good at it. <laughs> And I think you have to... Okay, what's the difference between a baker and a cooker in, in 
Well, one reason I'm not a natural baker is I don't enjoy the ingredients. Like, you know, I've described how much I enjoy working with the ingredients of cooking, sure. even really gross ingredients like raw chicken, which is disgusting. I enjoy that. But I don't really enjoy working with flour, sugar, baking soda. Um, I don't particularly enjoy mixing batters. Um, I hate kneading bread. So one thing is I think a natural baker enjoys those processes, whereas I don't. And I think baking, everyone always says, and I think it's true, you have to be very exact in baking. And I'm not really that exact. Oh, that's I'm so more interesting. I'm organic. Like the way, you know, like the recipes handed down from my mother say things like, um, you know, add half a palmful of rosemary. And I know how big my mom's palms are. So roughly what would her half a palm be? And I toss that in there. And if I don't have rosemary, I'm like, well, let's see how it tastes with sage since I'm out of rosemary. And, and I like that process. And in baking, that's disastrous. Mm -hmm. But in cooking, it tends to work just fine. I, and I tend to bake more than that. Uh, or I, I think my focus is more on baking. But I'm not mm -hmm. exact. Um, I, but I tend to do recipes mm -hmm. that I know really well. And uh, I will eyeball them. Well, the other thing, too, is <laughs> oh, you do anything, so, you get better at it. Uh, because I don't really enjoy baking... I've never done it enough to get good at it. If you enjoy it and you're doing it, you're doing it enough to get good at it and you can eyeball it. Uh, and you were, talk you were talking about not enjoying the ingredients and I think, but you didn't mention butter. <laughs> <laughs> and you, you mix flour and sugar with butter and you don't need anything else. <laughs> Okay, well, we really got off on a, on a fun <laughs> tangent there. Um, but And this is something I wanted to ask you earlier, and then we, we got off. Uh, oddly, Laura, I don't know how this happened. We got off on another tangent. Um, so let's go back to uh, talking about your genre. Um, and, and this could go either, for, uh, either or both, urban fantasy or the epic fantasy. What, what are the big things that people think they know about those genres? that they get wrong? Well, one that slaps me in the face immediately, um, in urban fantasy, there's a very common, I think at this point we could call it a common cliche, that people think is a requirement, and no, it's just a cliche, they think that your protagonist in an urban fantasy novel has to have magical powers. And I know people think this because it's often common. Esther Diamond, the protagonist of the Esther Diamond series, does not have magical powers. She is an ordinary person who gets mixed up in magical misadventures. The series is comedic. Um, and I have seen people um, like... Oh, uh, mm -hmm. before, we, before you go any farther, tell some oh, of the titles. Um, Disappearing the titles. Nightly. Uh, you've heard Doppelgangster. There's um, Vampirazzi. Uh, <laughs> Abracadaver, Polterheist, um, and so on. Yes, I like that. So, um, and the titles are Great really, titles. the titles are a killer to come up with because they have to be, each one has to be a self-evident supernatural pun that my editor thinks is funny. That is a pretty big list to fill. <laughs> <laughs> so the titles absolutely kill me. But um, anyways... Esther doesn't have magical powers. Um, Esther knows a few people who do, but she doesn't. And from the start, I saw people saying anything from, oh my God, that's so different, an urban fantasy heroine who doesn't have magical powers, to quite a few people saying, well, this author doesn't know anything about the genre because she doesn't realize her heroine's supposed to have this. It's like, no. You know, there is, I think, uh, definitely mm -hmm. more or less a requirement in fantasy that there has to be some sort of fantastical, magical, mystical, supernatural, non-realistic element. Um, in that phrase, I would include, say, um, literary magic realism, because there is something in magic realism which is mm -hmm. not realistic as we understand it in our culture. Uh, but no, there's absolutely no requirement that any specific character, or indeed any characters, have to have magical powers. I think that's a very common misconception. I think these days, I, I haven't run into it that much myself, but just it seems all too predictable that if you were writing epic fantasy, big sword and sorcery fiction, people would think that George Martin's work is the baseline for it and you need to do things the way he does it. 
because people tend to cleave onto uh-huh. something that is that influential and believe that defines a genre uh, in much the way that I'm sure many people would say, you know, Agatha Christie defines what a mystery novel or a cozy has to be. I, I think that that's probably fairly common at, at a guess with George Martin these days. And uh, you're, you're writing the Esther Diamond series. Are you um, open to thinking about wanting to continue to um, write epic fantasy also? I am, absolutely. I um, got burned out on it for a while and moved away from it. I really, really wanted to do this urban fantasy series. Um, And now I'm definitely feeling an interest in, um, I want to keep doing the Esther Diamond novels, which I thoroughly enjoy. But yeah, I also want to kind of mix it up a little now before I get burned out on urban fantasy. Maybe, you know, alternate. And um, I have an epic fantasy project I'm starting to make my notes about that uh, I would very much like to get to work on. Part of it is just I'm not that fast, and so uh, I'm moving slowly, but yes, definitely. So which of your books would you say is the best place for a reader who's entirely new to you to start? Um, You know, a lot of people seem to start with Doppelgangster and really like that as a starting place. Uh, it's and that's the first book. No, in, it's actually the second the book. Series? It's actually the second book in the Esther Diamond series. But because of the publishing history of that series, uh, I wrote Doppelgangster with the idea that it might be the first one people pick up. Because what happened with Esther Diamond huh. was, um, after years of not being able to sell it, uh, I fired my agent, and I immediately sold Esther Diamond to a publisher, Luna Books. And they released the first book, and it all went very badly. It was the wrong publishing house for Esther. I think they liked the book, but they didn't really know how to publish it very well, and I think there were problems with their program. And um, so the first book just disappeared overnight, disappearing nightly, Mm. and they canceled the rest of my contract. And I then fired my next agent, (laughs) and I resold the series to Betsy Wolheim at Daw Books, which is where it's been ever since. But the uh, I got all the rights back, but the first book, Disappearing Nightly, was still under contract at Luna, and it had just been published. Mm-hmm. We couldn't start with that, so Betsy was willing to try and launch the series with book two, even though it would be book two. So I And by then, book one wasn't even available in bookstores anymore, but the rights were still tied up. It couldn't be reissued mm. yet. So I wrote book two, Doppelgangster, with the idea that it was going to be a while before we could actually publish a new edition of the first book in the series, which uh, it was about two years before we could do that. So Doppelgangster is kind of a good place to start. Uh, I think I was a much better fit with Daw Books, so I think it's a much better book, in fact, than Disappearing Nightly. The Disappearing Nightly is fun. And um, I think people really seem to enjoy the concept, too, of these, you know, um, delving into the, the mafia and everything in this sort of ludicrous way. So I think that's a good one to start with. And if you don't like that, <laughs> you probably aren't going to like my writing. So, Do you have any books that even your dedicated readers might have overlooked as a sort of hidden gem? Uh, Well, not everybody who reads the Esther Diamond books even knows about the Solarian trilogy, because I I wrote the two series pretty far apart. Um, And I'm very proud of the trilogy, so I would encourage people to look at that. I also have a nonfiction book called Rejection, Romance, and Royalties, And that is a collection of essays about uh, being a working writer and what this life is like. And Mm. it's pretty fun. Um, It's actually based on a whole series of columns I did for Novelist Inc. uh, some years ago. And because it was, you know, it was released by a small press and had a fairly short shelf life, that's one that I think a lot of people don't know about. That's a great recommendation, especially for anybody who's either interested in the real realities of the writer's life, um, especially in the traditional model, um, or as an aspiring writer. It's also um, one of those amusingly depressing books. <laughs> It's a good way of putting because it. Because <laughs> it is re- realistic about that traditional model. Yeah. Um, Okay, I have some I have some questions from readers. Additional, we've we've already asked a few. One is, 
When you finish a book, do you miss the characters? I do. I miss them a lot. I've been living closely with them for months. And yeah. after I finish a book, I'm still very absorbed in them for a while. I think about them for several weeks afterwards, and I do miss them, yes. And have other uh, subsequent books ever arisen out of that period of missing them? You know, do you come up with new ideas for Yeah, them? back when I was a romance writer... Um, I started out years ago as a romance writer writing under a pseudonym. My work was very different then, but it did a few times then. I would have a character in a book I really liked, and I would just like, okay, let me make this the hero or heroine of my next book, and I did that a few times. Um, more recently, I've been writing series anyhow, you know, and when you finish the end of a trilogy, uh, I had put those characters in the Solarian trilogy through so much. I felt they had a well-deserved rest. They, they, they should be left alone for a while now, though I miss them a lot. Um, and Esther Diamond I'm still in the middle of. So some there are characters, though, that I, I develop in Esther Diamond that I think they're going to be in one book, and I really like them, so I make them kind of part of the regular cast. So, yes, sometimes it does result in something new. Great. This next reader asks, when the cover image doesn't match the character description, and she says, a pet peeve of mine, how does it feel? Well, I have so many stories about book covers, <laughs> <laughs> as do we all. I think the thing to keep in mind about that, uh, at least from a writer's perspective and in hopes of maintaining one's sanity, is that mm. doesn't really matter. What matters is that the cover of a book is supposed to be an accurate advertisement for your book. And the thing I look at when looking at it, I ask myself when looking at a cover is, does this cover accurately portray the tone and feel of the book? Does this cover convey the most important information? For example, the most important information about an Esther Diamond novel is that it's fantasy, it's funny, it's a series. Uh, it's urban fantasy, it's humor, it's a series. The cover's got to portray those three things. If it doesn't, it completely mm. fails, no matter how much the model might look like Esther Diamond. And in fact, when Luna Books, uh, which originally published Disappearing Nightly, the first book I mentioned earlier, when they published that book... The cover didn't convey even one of those things. You couldn't tell it was a fantasy oh, novel. You couldn't tell it was humor. You couldn't tell it was part of a series. So it failed on all counts, which was one of the reasons I felt sure as soon as I saw that cover that the book was going to fail because it didn't add the mm -hmm. cover didn't accurately in any way. It also didn't advertise the tone correctly. Nothing. Uh, the covers that Daw puts on there correctly convey all of that and correctly convey the tone. So I look at that a lot more than I look at, do the models look like the characters? I have had some covers though, that when I've looked at them, they were so bad that literally I cried. I, I shed actual tears. I thought, in fact, I thought that was disappearing nightly. I thought this is going to kill this book. This cover is so bad. And I've had that happen a couple of times and it is incredibly disappointing. I, th I think one of the aspects from the author's point of view, you know so many of the nuances and you know the ins and outs and the hearts of the book. And it, it's it's sort of like when people want you to write a blurb. And I, I'm, I come from a journalism background. I can be write headlines. But if I could have told the whole story in 300 words... I wouldn't have written 75,000, you know, <laughs> and to, to boil it back down is And once brutal. you've written 75,000 words, wouldn't you be so pissed off to find out you could have told the story <laughs> in just 300? <laughs> yes. Godly. So, so there's sort of that element with the covers, too, that the, the cover can never portray or convey the all the intricacies that are in the book and as, as you say the best they can do is give the reader um a, a, an entree to the mood of the book uh, to what they're going to get yeah, from that and book. that's i think what and, they should and, do and, mm -hmm. yeah. and that's all that they're intended for it's all they're needed for and it's what they've absolutely got to do well 
Um, I actually... But I really empathize with this reader, too, because it drives me nuts, too. I actually write my own cover blurbs. I learned to take it over from editors because I found I was doing it um, better. And, um, and then they, they tweak them. They maybe put them more into, you know, sale kind of language. And here's kind of a tip for aspiring writers. The way I learned to write synopses of a book and also the way I learned to write cover blurbs, I started out by spending a year... Every time I read a novel by someone else, I would then write a synopsis of it and I would write a cover blurb for it because you have that separation from someone else's work. And that's how you teach yourself the techniques to do it well for your own work. Okay, here's my contrasting tip for aspiring writers. Become an independent. (laughs) (laughs) Or you you never again have to write a synopsis. Mm -hmm. You do have to write blurbs now and then. But just your saying the idea of writing synopses of other people's books makes me want to bang my head against the (laughs) table. (laughs) I hate them so much. Oh my god! See, because I'm very methodical. I I, well, do I would never do other people's. Now I'm like, oh no, that sounds like so much work. But back then, it was valuable to me. I kind of like writing synopses for my own book. I always write a synopses before I start writing the book. It just kind of is like a roadmap for me because I'm very methodical. And it doesn't mean I'm shackled to it or constrained by it or must do what the synopsis says. It, it means that just like if I were driving from here to Los Angeles, I'd like to have a map, uh, even if I'm going to deviate from it. For me, it's the same. If I write a synopsis, now I have a map. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> In case, in case uh, listeners can't tell, I'm a total pantser. So, um, okay. Another lovely reader asks, "What is your favorite place to write, and why? Does it have an inspirational view?" No, <laughs> I have a, I have a view of a. <laughs> but it's still your favorite place to city. write. Why? I have a view of a parking lot. Um, Years and years ago, I lived in a crummy, crappy little place where I happened to have a wonderful view out the window. And I absolutely loved that view and I still miss it. Since then, I have never again lived in a place with a view, which is why I still think about that particular view. Generally, I like to write at home. Um, I write either in my home office or my bedroom. There's, I write at my desk or in a chair or in bed. I like quiet. Uh, I like privacy. Uh, I like to have a certain setup of notebooks and reference books and things spread around me in a pretty organized way. So that's what works for me. I don't um, like to write in cafes or in public. I've written in all sorts of places. When you have to, you do what you have to. I mean, I have actually written in airport waiting lounges and things, but uh, I'm generally not Mm -hmm. someone who takes my laptop on a trip so I can write while I'm away. I don't like to write in other places. I, I tend to break at home. And this is, this is a question I am eager to hear your answer to. Oh, dear. <laughs> and this is from a reader. If you could write a book with any other author, alive or dead, who would you want to work with and why? Oh, that's so easy. I think I would choose Sarah Codwell, who is dead. She was a British mystery writer. She died around the year 2000 or 2001. Uh, At the age of 60, she had only written four books. They are some of my favorite books. Uh, They're mystery novels. They're just so charming and delightful and erudite and intricate and entertaining and engaging. I met her once well before that at a conference. I met her probably in the late 80s or early 90s. And the reason I started reading her books was she was so charming and funny and interesting at this conference. I just thought, I got to read her work. Very dry humor. Very dry, very witty, very British. And I just think to do anything with her would be so much fun. So that's who I would choose. Oh, that's a surprising answer and a great one. Your most recent release was... Oh, it's been a couple of years now. It was Abracadaver, the seventh Esther Diamond novel. So you have seven in that series. That's so people have some yes. catching up to, to read with that. Yes. One. Also, that ser- I just wanted to say that series in the past, this year, that series uh, has been, all seven books have been produced uh, as full cast audio productions oh, by Graphic Audio, which is the coolest thing. And I sent a sample of that to your podcast address if you want to 
post that. There's like yes. a two minute sample. Absolutely. Um, it's really neat. Graphic Audio's um, promo or mar their their description of their format is a movie in your mind. So they hire different actors for all the different characters in the book. They have sound effects. So if uh, Esther Diamond's narration says there's an explosion, you hear the explosion. If she said, um, you know, uh, the crowd panicked, you hear people stampeding and panicking. Um, <laughs> There's oh, background music. It's a wonderful format for these books, and they've done a terrific job. Um, I actually had some anxiety about adaptation, but I'm so pleased with the way they've done it, and, and they've done a great job. So those were all released this year. That's really great, um, and I'm glad it's been a good experience for you, too. That's it has terrific. Been, yeah. So for readers to find, um, where's the one best place for them to go to find out more about you and about your books? Uh, my website, lauraresnick.com. Okay. Uh, I will also say Laura has a section there for aspiring writers and with information, uh, writerly information. I often send people there uh, to, to find her links. They're very useful. Um, okay, now we're going to, we're going to wrap up with some rapid fire questions. You have to say either or, um, I'm going to start with an easy one. Appetizer or dessert? Appetizer. Would you binge watch or would you make the watching last as long as possible? Binge watch. We could all be dead tomorrow. <laughs> Cake or ice cream? Cake. Day or but night. that's a tough choice. It is a tough choice. Day or night? Night. Toenail polish or bare toenails? Bear. Mountains or beach? Hmm, that's a tough one too. I guess I'll go with beach. Next one, dog or cat? Ironically, dog, but oh. I have a lot of cats and no dogs. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, I'm a dog dogs. person, but cats currently suit my lifestyle better. I like all animals, but... I would say primarily I'm a dog person. Tea or coffee? Coffee, but I like both. Garden, gardening or house decorating? Hmm, that's another tough one. I'm learning both as a new homeowner. Um, house decorating, I guess. Paint or wallpaper? Paint. Sailboat or motorboat? I get seasick. <laughs> Okay. Uh, save the best for last or grab the best first? Grab the best first. We could all be dead tomorrow. <laughs> There's a theme here. Yes. Uh, cowboy boots or hiking boots? Hiking boots. Oh, I thought you were going to say neither one. Okay. <laughs> I was wrong about that one. Well, this has been delightful, Laura. It's been wonderful spending some time with you again. And we didn't even have to run the world this time. So. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for inviting me, and best of luck with your new podcast venture. Thank you so much, and hope all of you listeners will come back next week for the next edition of Authors Love Readers. That's the show for this week. Hope you enjoyed it, and thank you for joining Authors Love Readers podcast. Remember, you can always find out more about our guest authors in the show notes, and you can find out more about me at www.patriciamclin.com. You can also send in questions to be asked of future authors at podcast at authorsloveleaders.com. Until next week, wishing you lots of happy reading. Bye.